This is the Six Man Show, an Orlando Magic podcast, with your hosts Luke Sylvia and Jonathan Osborne, covering all things Magic basketball by fans for fans. Go Magic! What's going on, Orlando Magic fans? You guys are back with the Six Man Show. Today is June sixth, two thousand twenty-two. Jonathan Osborne here. As always, I'm joined by my co-host, Luke Sylvia. Luke, what's up? It is the final episode that I will ever record in this apartment. Uh, it's where I recorded my first episode with the Six Man Show uh, back in 2020. So it, there is some sentimental, despite the, the bare walls that I always record with behind me and all of those things, it's, uh, it, there is some sentimental value for sure. Because on Wednesday night, um, I will be recording from a friend's house. Shout out Nathan Linbo, one of our uh, patrons, actually. just happens to be a best friend of mine. Um, so we're going to be recording there because we have to turn in like our Wi-Fi and all that, you know, cable and everything to, to, to Cox Cable and all that. So, um, so yeah. So this is the final um, episode that we'll be recording. Very special episode. Uh, we sat down and chatted with Kobe Price, the Orlando Magic beat writer of the Orlando Sentinel, just to talk about he was at the draft lottery in Chicago when that happened. So we talked about his reaction and just kind of being there and what that was like. Talked about the draft combine. Uh, we talked about um, the, the some of the other prospects, Jet Jabari. Luke made a reference to his internet service provider, and now we're laughing about that because we're five Jonathan years old laughing about it there was also there also might have been something that happened <laughs> in our interview with kobe price kobe price you know he did nothing wrong i was being mm. immature and he was talking about jabari <laughs> being a big long defender and i started laughing about that and kobe if you're listening i was not laughing at you i was i was just my own immaturity mm. came to the surface mm. i started laughing luke started laughing and now we're acting like idiots this again. all started with Jonathan, anyways by the way. anyway continue it was all my fault. It was Great. all my fault twice now. So I do mm -hmm. apologize. But um, yes, so it was a great chat with Kobe Price. Always very insightful, uh, closer to the team really than anybody. So if there's anyone to ask these questions of, it would be Kobe Price. So again, really appreciate Kobe Price joining the show. Always great to sit down with Kobe. Coming up on the 23rd, the night of the NBA draft, We'll be having like a pre-draft hangout kind of thing at Harry Buffalo from 5 o'clock to 6.30. And then the Magic are having their official draft party at Amway starting at 6.30. So we're going to walk over from Harry Buffalo to Amway. We're all going to try to sit in section 106, hang out there just like we did last year, and watch the draft unfold. Now, Kobe made a reference to this on our with our chat with him. We've seen it on social media People are very, like, clearly at this point drawing the line in the sand. It's been, you know, about three weeks now since the NBA draft lottery. People are now really, like, tightening down the person that they want the Magic to pick at one. You're seeing, like, less um, indecisiveness. You're seeing people be a lot more clear on who they want the Magic to draft. And in some pockets of Orlando Magic Twitter, it's getting kind of, you know, chippy. It's getting a little ugly. You know, people are uh, are really, like, disparaging some of the other guys to make the case for the guy that they want to pick. Me, I know where a lot of other people are. Like, we are really good with Paolo, Chet, or Jabari at number one. But I felt the need to say this. The night of the draft, we're all going to be packed into the Amway Center. There's going to be cameras on fans reacting to the pick, remember that, okay? Be conscious of that in the moment. The way that you react, the entire NBA world is going to be looking at Orlando that night to the way that we react to that pick, okay? This is the point where I'm going to tell you, keep it together regardless of who the magic pick. If you're ecstatic, be ecstatic. If you're unhappy with the pick, just stand there <laughs> and clap anyways, don't boo. Don't show your disgust. The whole world is going to see that. And the guy that we draft is going to see that as well. And that is not a good way to start his career. I'm not a fan of telling people to you know hide their emotions or fake their emotions or anything like that, except in this instance. Because again, there's going to be a microscope on Orlando that night. And if we are booing the pick, 
it will be exactly like that little kid booing the Chris Stapps Porzingis pick back in 2015 or whenever that draft was with Porzingis. Okay, so just remember that again. The night of the draft, if you are at Amway, just react appropriately to the draft. And this is what I will say. You want to cheer the number one mm-hmm. pick, who, regardless of who it is, because you want you need them to be successful. If you care about this team the way that you say you do, the way that you claim to, you need this guy to be successful in Orlando. Because if it's not, it's going to put this franchise back a number of years. So whoever the pick mm-hmm. is, react you're, appropriately. You're That's you're all expected. I'm going to say. Cheer yes. the pick. Now, if they turn out to be a bust, drag them through the mud, call them a bust, whatever you want. Six months from now, one year, two year, three year, four year, five years from now, whatever you want to do, the night of the draft, do not boo. Yeah, yeah. I, I think that, and what I'll add is like, yes, you should cheer for the number one pick in any circumstance. It's the number one pick. Here's the other thing, right? The the people that I see, you know, Twitter wherever twitter's the only place let's be honest that i look at magic stuff um from other fans and stuff so what i'll say there's a lot of people like you said they're drawing the line in the sand they see things and then they don't see things right like they when it comes to jabari or chet they say oh man like i'm good with with paulo or or chet but i just don't see it with jabari or vice versa right i just don't see it i see a lot of people saying that I, i'll give you my two cents i don't care if you don't see it i don't care because you're not the one getting paid to see it, you know. Like you're 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 a person that is not that is not their job, and 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 at all, like in any sense, right? So it just it pains me, right? These people in the top, these players are top three for a reason. So come draft night, trust the front office, be a Magic fan, and cheer for that player. Because guess what? Whether you like it or not, there's you're stuck with them. You're stuck with them for a while because it's going to take a little bit for anyone to give up on them. Hopefully, we don't get to that point. But if you boo in that moment, if there's a section of you guys that are booing, they put it on ESPN. They put it on Bleacher Report. They put it everywhere. It's going FS1. It's going everywhere. And the only person that's going to look dumb in this case is in a few years if that player has like blossomed into an incredible player. And be like, ah, remember when they booed? Bunch of idiot fan base. I'm done. Being the being the irrelevant fan base, so let's cheer, and just hope that this guy becomes a, a, an all star, superstar, everything that we need him to be. Because, like Jonathan said, this is really the the course of this franchise rests on the draft. And I would even say, if you boo, you're going to look like an idiot that night. Like nobody's like, oh yeah, look at that guy booing. Cause that guy sucks. Like nobody knows. So just don't boo. React appropriately to the to the draft. That's true, and. And well, God, well, God, you you don't you don't you know you well, God does not reveal who he is, right? Shout out, well, God. But what I will say is, if Jabari gets drafted, and there's only <laughs> one guy in the arena booing, that's well, God to me for the rest of time. So remember that if you're listening to this, well, God, I'll never hear anything else. People will be like, that's actually well, God. I'm like, no, it's not. It's the one person I saw booing Jabari get picked that night. So there's that. All right, folks, really quickly before we get into the conversation that we had with Kobe Price, we're going to go ahead and shout out our brand new patrons. So shout out to Jonathan Parent and the Squad Up Podcast, our newest patrons. Really, really appreciate you guys. Uh, Little Penny, I don't know if we we shouted out Little Penny last week. He's a new patron as well. If I already shouted you out, well, you just got another shout out, but uh, appreciate all of our new patrons. If you guys are interested in helping financially support the show and help us do what we do, you can find us at patreon.com slash the six man show. And we shout out our new patrons every single week. New added benefit. We're going to start doing monthly raffles. We're going to raffle off a free six man show t-shirt each month. Um, And we're also getting ready to ship uh, ship out some awesome stickers, six man show stickers to, um, you know, each of our patrons. So if you guys are interested in any of that, uh, make sure you go ahead and sign up for the Patreon. And we're also uh, working on the the discord is really popping off lately so if you guys want to be able to communicate with us there again you can join one of the patreon tiers that we have again patreon.com slash the six man show and then we shout out all of our patrons every single episode shout out court cousins drew gooden armin keith garcia zico carson tulo nathan lynn 
Ellis, Jonathan Borges, Norm L, Magic Player History, Julio, Bailey, Matt Lyman, Eric Segovia, Gabe Gaines, Wiffle, Michael Martin, Jamel Miller, Franz Goda Fichot, Ryan Singh, Blake Bickerstaff, The Distract, your boy Dave J, Eric Randall, Pierre A, Wally Akbar, Eli, Migzors, Nostalgia, and M&Ms, Dylan Holden, Mr. Mikey, Joe Thomas, Stephen Walker, Lil Penny, Jonathan Parent, and the Squad Up Podcast. Thank you guys all so much. Without further ado, we are going to get to the conversation with Kobe Price. And now we are joined by Orlando Magic beat writer for the Orlando Sentinel, Kobe Price. Second time on the show. Uh, when he was first on the show, he was just getting settled in Orlando. Kobe, did any of our listeners come and help you move like we talked about? <laughs> How was the move in? The move in was smooth. Uh, nobody actually came to help me. In their defense, in their defense, I didn't follow up on the okay. asking. All right, all right. My my stepdad helped me move it in. I was good from that point. My girlfriend helped. My girlfriend came like the following week, so we were all good. Didn't need any help, so I didn't ask. That's not on okay, them. That's okay. Okay. All right. All right. I, I have great belief that they would have come we, through. We, we are about to have to have a whole sidebar with our listeners for not helping out Kobe. But uh, how are you uh, like in Orlando so far? No, no, Orlando's nice. I really like it. I, I know we were talking about this off camera, you know, before the recording, but like just early today. You know, I live near the arena. I live downtown, so I was just you know walking around the downtown Orlando area, um, at least when it wasn't as sunny outside. You know, get get the clouds. Yeah. So I'm not smoking while walking by. I like it. You know, nice city. It's you know vibrant, so it's, it's a good place to be. I mean, you you know you know Florida. You, you were in South Florida for a while. This time of year, you can't step outside for more than 30 seconds without coming back. You know, sweating like crazy. But Kobe, your yeah yeah your first yeah. season. Yes. Tell me about it. Yeah, your first season covering the team now. Um, how was the season from from your perspective? You know, covering the team. How was it for you? Uh, for me personally, just like a huge learning experience. You know, first time you know covering an NBA team. You know, for significant chunks of the season, I've done NBA work in the past, backup writer, blogging, etc. But to go through an entire season, day in and day out, it, it was definitely a learning experience and something that I cherish, something I'm grateful for. Uh, if you look at it from, I guess, like covering the magic there was a lot of uh a lot of game stories that had to do with losses uh so that may like just find some new interesting angle each and every game or each and every day was definitely something that pushed me as you know a writer as someone who's like you know trying to bring ideas to the table um but all in all it was smooth i enjoyed it and i appreciated the process i uh, appreciated the process but also you know the experiences that came along the way what what did you find yourself, Kobe, like as far as, you know, obviously prior to this, you were still in like a, a beat role, right? But in, in, in a different sport, right? A different environment there. What was that kind of like, I guess, being just tethered to, to, to basketball and, and not, you know, what was the kind of the difference, the contrast and experience for you? And also going from that to the NBA too. Yeah, no, so before this, I think we talked about this on the previous time I was on, you know, covering a college football team day in and day out, completely different rhythm, mm -hmm. a completely different vibe, and covering an NBA team day in and day out, which is what I wanted to do ultimately, you know, get to the NBA, be on the NBA beat. But, you know, you could imagine you know, college football, what, you have four non-conference games, and so you got, what, 12 games, maybe 14 games, 15 if you're, like, mm -hmm. the best team in the country. For NBA team, that's just a month, right? <laughs> so it's just a lot more. Uh, it's just a lot more games. The rhythm's completely different. You know, for college football, you know, you take probably more time to like analyze a single game, analyze a single moment. Like you can spread it out a little bit more. For a basketball game, it's like, hey, we just played a game on Tuesday in Boston. Guess what? We got a game on Wednesday in New York, and then you have a game, another game on Friday in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So it's that kind of stuff. That, you know, the rhythm of it is completely different, and you just have to be able to move on quicker, you know, jump from thing to thing quicker, um, especially, when, you know, as a beat writer. Then also pacing yourself, because, like, college football, you're trying, like, or even just football generally, you know, NFL college football, you know, it's only a small segment of the year. You only have, you know, so many games. So you can take a, I'd be a little bit more patient with some ideas, um, but with the NBA beat, you have to, you know, stretch it out a little bit more, because you're talking about going from, well, for me, I did December to April in terms of playing, but count the preseason, it's October to mid-April. That's just the regular season. So it's just a lot more finding the little things um, mm -hmm. that you can pinpoint, you know, from game to game, from moment to moment. Um, and just things like that. That's probably the biggest thing that I took away from this. Kobe, how much traveling did you do with the team this season? Were you able to get on the road? 
Yeah, I, uh, I'm trying to think. How many road trips did I do? I did the Brooklyn, Toronto, Atlanta road trip in December, which just turned into Brooklyn and Atlanta. Because mm. when I, like, within five minutes of getting to my hotel, maybe five to That's ten minutes. That's right. I remember hotel, you tweeting Toronto, about that. Yeah, the game got postponed. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I was like, well, just got here. Uh, thanks for everything. <laughs> COVID. Oh, what was that? Delta Omicron, one of the two. Uh, that was definitely Omicron. Thank, thanks for everything. Uh, so I was just in Toronto. So that was my first road trip. Just a really strange one. Um, then I did a couple others. Uh, I did uh, D- uh, I'm gonna say DC and Charlotte, Wizards and Hornets in mid-January, I want to say. And then I did Cleveland, Cleveland and, oh, Cleveland and Wizards uh, in late March. Uh, and then I did, like, uh, I did the Nuggets. Uh, like, the ba- they did that West Coast road trip. I think it was, like, Phoenix. I don't remember the exact. It was, like, Phoenix, Utah, the Nuggets. And I, in Portland, I, the last game of the trip was Denver. So I did that trip, too. Right before the All-Star break. I think yeah, it was like that Denver, was and then we were had it like Atlanta at home, I think, and then the All Star break. Kobe, the other day we were yeah. talking in our in our group chat, me and and Jonathan and our uh, producer Kevin, we were we were just we we're talking about like what are your you know top five arenas that you would want to go watch the Magic play in, whatever kind of be. So I don't want to necessarily say like that question, but Kobe, was there any arena you went to this season where you were like, man, this is like check this off the bucket list, and and outside of that. Which one did you not get to go to that you're still looking forward to going to? Oh man, I say I, I'm not. I'm not trying to be rude at all. I'm just pu- pulling up my phone because oh, my dad and I have actually had this conversation uh, this season. So if you go on the iPhone, you can just like right. search. I'm looking up right. arena. Um, yes, there. There. So the one arena that I didn't get to go to this season that I definitely want to go to uh, is. Playoffs are on finals on right now. I want to go to uh, what is it now? Chase mm-hmm. Chase Center, Chase, yeah. Chase Center. I was about to say Oracle and mess up the entire podcast. Yeah, Chase Center. I Real ones know about there. Oracle. Real ones know wouldn't know what you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They've only been there for what three years, so I think yeah. you still have in twenty twenty four. If you're still calling it Oracle, then that I guess that's like the point <laughs> where you're like, all right, catch up now. Get out the get out the old man clouds. But yeah, no, um, that's definitely one I want to go to. The, of the arenas I went to this season. Barclays, I really like Barclays. It wasn't as it's kind of weird because it's just like it just like right in the like plopped in the middle of Brooklyn and you just kinda of like, oh. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, and I guess it's kinda of like a more New York thing, um, if anything else, because you're used to like arenas being like kind of pushed to the side or like having their own like little mm. quote unquote like section of a city if that makes sense. Yeah. But for Barclays, it's just like Right there, he's like, oh, okay. You kind of stroll up on it and be like, oh, shoot. But it's really nice. The inside's really nice. The arena that is probably going to surprise people that's really nice, but it's a really nice arena, Cleveland. Mm-hmm. The Cavs have a really, really nice arena. Uh, I think they reno- they renovated it, I think, in 2018, I want to say. It, I think it was after LeBron left. And the, rem- the reason I can kind of remember this, these are the 2018 and 2019. Because when Kevin Love signed his extension that I think he's currently on, like I think he signed it, and they were like wearing hard hats inside the arena. Mm-hmm. Um, I could be wrong. If someone wants to pull up that clip on YouTube Le- or Twitter, <laughs> by all means. LeBron, LeBron left, and they, and they decided they had to do something to keep, keep fans in the arena, so they, they <laughs> renovated the whole thing. What is that now, but like yeah. the Rocket, Rocket Mortgage mm-hmm. Fieldhouse or something like that? It used to be the Quicken Loans. Now it's like Rocket Mortgage something or other. Maybe. Yeah, Rocket Mortgage. Not Morgan. important. <laughs> Don't don't sell rocket mortgage that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, true, true, true. <laughs> yes, they don't that much money. Right. It's very important. Um, but yeah, that's probably one of the nicer arenas that I've been in. Mm. Um, Cleveland, it, it was it's really nice. It's really really nice. Now you also did some traveling recently, Kobe. You you were in your hometown of Chicago uh, for the mm-hmm. lottery and for the the draft combine. I want to ask you about the draft combine in, in a little bit, but. Being at the lottery, obviously you're covering the magic, uh, you know, hoping to get the number one pick going into that night. What were your emotions, you know, if any, you know, going into to that night? Were you a little anxious? Were you excited? How were you feeling? Um, emotionally, I was just kind of like, all right, because well, it's my first time going to the lottery. So for me personally, I'm just kind of like, all right, what's this all going to be about? Like, I'm asking people, like, just personally, professionally, I'm just like asking people, 
what's going on, what's going to happen, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so to kind of peel back the curtain, I'm sure people know this, but there's a room, like the actual lottery happens like an hour before what we see on TV, right? Yeah. Um, so there was, I was also like kind of nervous. I was like, wait a second, was I invited into that room? <laughs> Am I going to that room? But if I if I if I'm going to that room, I don't have my phone or my laptop on me. So like, what am I gonna do? What's going on here? But then like someone later told me like probably like an hour and a half to two hours before the lottery. Like if you were supposed to be in that room, you would know. <laughs> so don't worry about it. I was like I kind of want to go in the room just to see what happens, but I really don't because I need to like be out here to right. like, to see everything. Because people in the room can't watch the. They're not inside the. Uh, they're not inside where the like the television the televised mm-hmm. right the broadcast. So, like, yeah, the actual uh, broadcast of the lottery. So I was just kind of like, that was like kind of nerve wracking. But once I got that, I was like, all right, we're good. But it was just kind of one of those experiences where I was just trying to think, all right, how's this going to go? The pacing of it. Thank God for commercial breaks because uh, that really helped like help me be like, all right, I have my story ready for whatever's going to happen. Commercial breaks just helped me like slow down mentally a little bit. What? Uh, so I was just kind of more just not nerve wracking, but just a little anxious to see what would happen. What did and they do? What what they do, Kobe, during like the the commercial break before the top four picks were revealed? Like, do does it just like cut to commercial and does someone come up on the stage at all and like just to you know, break like silence? That might be weird. Like, obviously, there's so much energy probably in that room, and then they you know they they just cut to commercial for us you know people watching on TV. Did they do anything during that commercial break? Uh, to be honest, I don't think so. I'm I'm gonna be completely honest. I was like working mm-hmm. like. I'm During sure everybody was. Break, top, yeah. Yeah. Between like the top, you know, after the, the I guess the top four was re- was revealed, I was like on my laptop, <laughs> just like, all right, let me delete this. Let me replace this. Let me do that. Um, but I don't remember any, like nobody was saying anything right. in terms of like. They didn't have like anybody on stage with a mic or anything like that. Kind of try to yeah. entertain the guests. Yeah, no, because there's, I mean, there are a lot of guests in there too. Right. I think that's actually undersold. Mm. Like there are a lot of people in that room um you know i'm bad with like estimates just from my eye sense but it's like i feel like it's like a hundred a couple hundred people in that room that's in the cool. lottery room so i mean people are just talking amongst themselves especially at the top four so you don't really need a a person in there like hey guys we're about to do x y and z and like, people are just like you know, some people are anxious some people are like oh i can't believe this team like sacramento i think was the team that people are like yeah. oh, about because they just top uh right. to the top four where were you like in the the I, is it's like a ballroom where the broadcast is right? Yeah. Where are you in relation to like Jeff Weltman, Alex Martins, and that whole crew? Um, to be honest, I don't. I'm not sure where they were sitting. I was way in the back. I guess if that helps you out, mm-hmm. I was just in the back because like the front row is like the front few rows are for like guests, team personnel, um, the players, prospects who are actually in attendance. So the media is like all the way in the back, kind of closer. So I was closer to where um, the ESPN booth was set up or whatever, like their stage was set up where, you know, where you have Malika Woj, like all of them up there. Uh, I was back there. So I can not actually see um, the magics. You know, I couldn't see Jeff John at first. And then when I went up to the stage after it was over, then I could see them. So I'm not sure. I imagine they were somewhere in the front because I think that's where – most uh, NBA personnel. Was. What what did you do, Kobe? And I mean, you could tell us or not. I guess if it's more private. What like after the number one pick? Like you're obviously putting together your piece and everything. Did you did you take like um did you go out in Chicago or like was there any festivity for you and, and any type of celebration or was it all work when you were when you were there? No, I'll be honest with you. It was all work. Yeah. Uh, that night specific. I mean, it was also later because. Uh, I mean, yeah, after that, I mean, I wrote my story, fleshed it out. You know, mm-hmm. just, I think people saw the videos. You know, talk with Jeff, talk with um, Jamal, talk with Alex, talk uh, talk with uh, Cole DeVos. You know, just talking with people. And then I hope, like, I recorded a podcast that night. Um, well, around like 10 p.m. So I think we're done around like 10:30. So after that, and then the next day is when the the uh, the combine starts like the actual NBA draft combine. So there wasn't really much time to be like, mm-hmm. Oh, not that I would anyway, but you got to get up extra early the next morning. So it's just kind of like straight I, work. I had to ask. Cause I know that, that, that Weltman, Joel glass, I just, I know, you know, they, I know they popped a bottle of champagne. I mean, I know their, their <laughs> night was fun. I know that that's probably, that's gotta be true. 
Uh, yeah, they wouldn't. They didn't give me the details about celebration. <laughs> uh, I know. I know. I'm sure we'll get into this a lawyer, but I know they had some long days. The, the combine, I think, is underrated just how long it is, and we can get a little bit into like why it's so long right. a little later. But they had especially Wednesday through. Well, I guess the entire Monday through Friday. Just a long week for everybody. Well, let's rewind just a little bit. I want to know what your reaction was to the Magic getting the number one pick. So you see Houston's card come up at number two. What is next for Kobe Price? Yeah, okay. I'm going to even go back a little bit further. I okay. was at my laptop. Like, so I I wasn't like from 14 to eight. I was kind of like, all right, let's just like get this over. Because they're not, they're not going to be in there. I'm more just interested in seeing like what other teams get in there. Like mm-hmm. are any other teams going to like – move around is the team going to jump up like sacramento not going was kind of like huh all right let's see where this goes so like from 14 to 8 i was just kind of like all right once it gets to like seven i'm like all right let me get like let me sit up a little bit everybody knows that meme right with like the controller oh, yeah. <laughs> let me sit yeah so then i'm like i have my laptop open the entire time uh with like pre like store like pre-written stuff for there so when they get to seven i'm like all right gotta be ready because this team's luck who knows right mm. <laughs> if we get to like we're about to get to six, I need to be ready if, if right. six pops up. So six doesn't pop up. I'm like, all right. I'm like really, you know, I'm like I'm like ready for five. I'm like, yeah. ooh, I can just. I'm feeling bad about this. So then five hit. When five hit, I was just like, oh, all right, commercial. I didn't know there was going to be a commercial break, so mm-hmm. I just kind of put one up. Be like, oh, I think I commercial break. <laughs> so then the countdown four, like four, from four to one, I was just kind of like shoulders tense, just ready to just write the entire time. So when two when two comes, to be honest, I thought they were going to just stay stay pat. I thought they were going to get two, so I was ready for two. And when I see Houston's at two, the first thing I can say is, I'm not going to curse. <laughs> Holy bleep! <laughs> <laughs> That's the first thing I could think. Of. I was like, oh, bleep! I can't bleep and believe this. Uh, so I got the story up <laughs> immediately, and I'm like, ah, because I tell people. I knew that I was prepared for them to get number one, but I really truly did not expect that to happen, especially in the history. But people were saying it's the, like they're due. Even talking to people Monday and Tuesday at the G League Combine, they're like, oh, yeah, they're due to get number one. Like they've had such bad luck recently. I'm like, yeah, maybe. Right. So when they get one, I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> Yeah, this changes a lot. Did did you, Kobe? Like, I, I from a writer's perspective, I'm I'm interested. Just um, as far as when it's going on, did you have like a piece written for a Magic getting each pick, or like did you um, did you just have a template that you kind of just went through, like, or did you kind of brainstorm for all pieces and have it all on like certain docs and everything? No, no. I, so that's what I was doing like the entire time mm. when like the picks were, were going from whatever. I, I think I said like seven or eight yeah. to down to one. Right. I had pre-written stories for one through six because that's all I knew. Right. right? Um, so I had pre-written for one, two, three and four were going to be like a similar story and five or six were going to be a similar story. Okay, gotcha. Um, so if that makes so I guess it's almost like four pre-written stories for the six picks. One, two, yeah. three and four, and then five and six. So when the commercial break hit, I deleted five and six, mm-hmm. uh, and like I like made made adjustments to one, two, three, and four. When three and four passed, I deleted those quickly. <laughs> um, so I was just I didn't really need to, to be honest with you. I could have just like waited, but I was just like, all right, yeah, because I'm not trying to make any mistakes. There's not going to be any error. Let's just get those out the way. It's a checklist. So I just have one. what's up? It's a checklist for you. You're easy yeah, to exactly. just check those off. Get them out of here. Yeah. So I just have one and two, like ready, just copy and paste into into the doc. And when I saw Houston come up, um, uh, not not uh, OKC. Okay, see, when I saw OKC come up, I was like, oh, all right, one, let's go. Oh my gosh, what the heck's happening? Uh, how did this happen? What in the world's going on? So I just then after that, I just went up to the stage. I was like, all right, let's figure this out. So everybody comes off the stage, right? And then you've got you know Jeff and John and uh, you know Mosley, Cole DeVos. What was the the energy like? I know we saw the videos after, but can you explain that a little bit? Describe that a little bit for us. Oh, I mean, just the mo- like pure excitement from them. Like the group was just there. You know, I, th- I wish I saw the had the video in front of me. Like I think like Jeff and John were like jumping up and they're like, yeah, just. It was some of the most pure joy you can find, you know, amongst NBA personnel, uh, especially like 
front office outside of, you know, maybe winning a championship or whatever it may be. I think because especially, you know, they've been, you know, I guess outside of Mosley, they've all been like this, this core, you know, Joel, Jeff, John, uh, Alex, like they've been here for a while. So they've seen the misfortunes, you know, year in and year out with the draft. So I think some of it was just like, finally, this is our, you know, we finally you know, reaping benefits of this process, of this rebuilding process. I guess the ultimate benefits of it and by getting the number one pick. So it was like some of the most pure joy um, excitement you'll you'll see, uh, I think, you know, considering the circumstances. It was like that at Harry Buffalo too. It was just <laughs> pure pure jubilation. We had a we had a good time. Switching gears a little bit, Kobe, you were there for the draft lottery, but you were also there to cover the combine. I, I know there's a lot that goes on in you know just a couple minutes, can you tell us everything that happens at the combine, things that people might not realize? Yeah, I think the combine you know, I guess I'll touch on the stuff that people kind of know. You know, the most I'll kind of work to things that people don't know as well. So obviously people know their measurements. Um, players get interviewed in the in the morning before the entire combine actually starts. You know, before the drills, before the scrimmages, before all that goes down. Um, so you have your interviews typically in the morning. That's why that's why the pers- uh, person has to wake up so early because those can be as early as 8 a.m. Uh, 8 p- 8 you know, you know, a lot of them are waking up, trying to get out about like seven thirty. Do the interviews with the players, and those are how the interviews go. Is you know, before the draft lottery even happens, teams will send in a list of, I guess you want to say, like requested players, guys they want to talk to. And I think it's team teams can speak up to twenty, uh, can interview up to twenty players. And players can talk to up to 13 teams during the combine. I think I, I think I'm remembering that correctly based off what the league told me. So they're like the league's in charge of like figuring out who interviews with who, which names, you know, that that kind of stuff. So then the, the play, then the teams, you know, they go through it each morning, you know, interviewing the uh, the players. Then from there, you get your drills, you get your measurements, you get your scrimmages, um, and it, it gets, I guess, a little less busy as the the. Uh, the combine goes on, been, and at the end of the night, you get your pro days, uh, and that's like what makes the day so long. Because maybe by like four thirty to six thirty, the actual "quote unquote" NBA combine portion of it's over. But then a lot of the agencies have their pro days after the combine, so it may be like up to three or four agencies post combine inside the same gym having a pro day, and those can last up to you know thirty minutes to an hour. So if you end at six thirty, you could be in the gym till nine thirty that night watching, you know, three different agencies doing the combo, uh, doing the pro days. So that's where you really get the long days. You know, you're talking about from seven thirty to nine thirty. You know, interviews, measurements, scrimmages, uh, drills, and then you have the pro days at the end of the night, um, run by uh, by the agencies. Um, and then obviously, you know, within that, you know. They can still eat, but a lot of it's also a lot of mingling, you know, between personal, uh, between you know, NBA teams and front offices and coaches, assistant coaches, scouts. Like they're all in there, trying to end it up, uh, you know, just getting, you know, probably. I think how it's been described to me is like a lot of them just, you know, made me like see where each other's at, and it's also helpful because they, everybody knows where they're at in the lottery, so maybe you can get like a little bit of a feel, like other teams can feel out like how the other teams feeling, what they're doing, how they're thinking, you know. The the results are not the results. The it's almost like laying the groundwork for the actual draft, and not just in terms of the scouting, but also like figuring out what other teams are thinking as well. Did you speak? Obviously, Kobe. Like, there's a lot going on, right? Like you said, there's super long days. Were you prepared for how long the days would be with that? Like, did you talk to other people that were on you know the beat for their team or whoever, just to get maybe people within like for the Magic cover the Magic as well? There, who, did you pick anybody's brain about like what to expect uh, for this whole trip and especially for those long days? Oh no, absolutely. I spoke with my editor about it because he he covered on the NBA for a while, so we spoke about it pretty extensively um, before the combine. So I was prepared for how it would go, but um, this is the first combine since COVID. Um, well, I guess last year, but it was, I guess last year was even different. Like this was really, I guess the first one, I guess to the level that it was in terms of the amount of people. Um, so I was prepared for it, but once you actually, it's always like, you can like hear about it and learn about it, but once you're actually in there mm-hmm. and you get a really, like a really much better feel for the rhythm of it. And I forgot to even mention like for the media side, for us, a lot of, that's where we get to talk with a lot of the players. You know, we have the interviews after their scrimmages, 
depending on which team they're on. Um, so yeah, I, I I knew what to expect, but even then, I was just kind of like, it's like stuff was moving so quickly, especially Wednesday. Like when by the time Thursday and Friday came, I was like, all right, I know what's going on. But Wednesday, it just felt like mm-hmm. like Road Runner. This this is going on. That's going on. This, but, all right, gotta get here. Gotta get. It's like oh shoot, yeah, there's a lot going on. Right. Yeah, you just talked about the like the player interviews a, a moment ago. Um, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was Wednesday. Was when like Paolo, Jabari, Chet, Shaden Sharp were scheduled to meet with the media, and I think it was Shaden Sharp first that canceled his media availability. Then all the other guys kind of followed suit pretty soon after that. Did you ever get a vibe for like why that was, or is that something that's pretty common at the combine? Yeah, I don't think Shaden was the first one. I think it was like I it could was be a group wrong. Of yeah, yeah, it was a group of three. I'm not remembering like who was in the group of three, um, but it was like I want to say it was a group of three. Who um, who was announced maybe like forty five minutes before they're supposed to speak that they weren't speaking because it was the non um, the non scrimmage so the guys who weren't scrimmaging they usually speak first on maybe it's yeah maybe it's Wednesday Wednesday or Thursday they usually speak first amongst like all the people all the all the participants but yeah it's typically is something that may happen um, you know a lot of the top guys they, they won't they don't scrimmage. Um, and they may not speak with the media. That, that's just, I think, to, among like the consensus top seven, top ten, I think Keegan Murray was the only guy who spoke, the only guy you know who actually you know did his media availability. And to his credit, like he not only did it, but he was there for a minute too. Like he, I remember he was speaking for a solid amount of time because I remember seeing like there was a crowd around him at first. So I was like, All right, I'm gonna come back a little later to speak with him. Then I came back. And then I spoke with him for a little bit, and then I left, and I came back. Like there were some people speaking with him, so he, to his credit, like he did the, his full, he did his full thing. He did his full, uh, his full slot. But yeah, a lot of times, like the top guys, they they don't do as much as say a guy who's trying to make their way from the second round to the first mm-hmm. round, or even a guy who's trying to like stay in the first round, uh, so to speak, or you know, guys who are just trying to fight for a spot. Period. Was there anybody, Kobe, that you spoke to that just like blew you away? That not necessarily that you didn't have high expectations for, but was there anybody that was surprising to you that in like an interview setting they just absolutely crushed it when you were you know around? Oh, uh, I think all like most of the guys I spoke to um, were pretty good. Key, like I'll just give uh, I'll give credit to Keegan again. Really solid interview. Um, really really solid and i guess that you know something that goes back to his maturity and his age i think he is what 21 um so of like the prospects he's on the older side of them three years removed from high school um among the top prospects of least um and then jalen williams from santa clara another guy who i spoke with a decent amount um good another good interview too was there a, a prospect in terms of like on the floor that really surprised you at the combine um, on the floor. I mean, I guess I knew. I'll go back to Jalen Williams. I knew he was good. Um, but he like it, it was more than just his on the floor. It was his measurements and the on the floor. I think of the one scrimmage I saw, he did. Um, he just pops. Uh, and some of it, like some of it, you're trying to like remember, like oh, which guy? Because they're wearing different numbers, so you're just trying to like like catch up. So there weren't a whole lot of guys that surprised me in that way. But he just stood out immediately. He was like, oh yeah, that guy's probably gonna. I mean, it seemed like. Especially after the combine, he's just going to rise in this, uh, in whatever post, post lottery, post combine uh, mock drafts or draft boards because he's like the talent level is clear and the poise and the tools were clear with him. I know there are some uh, some people that were hoping the Magic might be able to draft him in the second round. From what Kobe is saying, it doesn't sound like he might be there in the second round. Yeah, if he if he gets to the second round, uh, I'll say it first. I'd be shocked. Um, or let me. I'll be surprised. I'll be very surprised. Maybe not shocked because I know how this stuff goes, but he's definitely a guy who, if he was like projected in that late first, early second stage before the lottery, which I think he was, to me, he's definitely you know somewhere in that late first range. If he fell into the second round, I'd be quite surprised. Now, I guess that's a, a good segue, Kobe, for as far as like when it comes to draft night and what the Magic do, it is no secret that the Magic have kind of strayed from their second picks, their second round picks um, on those draft nights. Do you expect the Magic to stay put? I mean, to adding two additional young guys could be, you know, a, a little worrisome, I think, for Magic fans to just continue to add young players to this already young roster. 
do you what do you think or like do you have any type of sense of of what the magic do with those second round picks come draft night yeah i mean I, well first i think john hammond you know even during the, the telecast of the combine i think he openly said like they're looking into you know what they mm. could do with second round possibly pray into the back end of the first round and you know something like that i i would right now and this is more so you know speculation with a little bit of information uh I would expect them to try to get into the, like very much push them to get into the back end of the first round, just because like, to your point, um, even if it's not both picks, like maybe they keep us, maybe they own like trade into the back with only one and then they still have a second and then like two first, I guess I would just be surprised if they came out of there using both seconds. Um, it, for the reasons you said, uh, but also I think there's opportunity for them to, you know, maybe get, their guy, right? Like maybe they're like their guy, they're not as confident he's gonna fall to 32. So maybe they could try to trade until, you know, 22, 24, 26, you know, somewhere in that range to get their guy in the back in the first round who they thought maybe could have been in the second round, but they really want to secure their guy. Um, but yeah, I, I would be, I, I, I would be surprised if they use both second round picks. I'd be extremely surprised if they use both second round picks. I'm expecting them to only at, at most use one of the second round picks. Now the other one may, maybe they trade it out to another year. If they can't get into the back end of this first round, like trade it, like maybe they just try to roll over into another year, but I don't see them adding to, to you, I guess, use both second round picks in this draft. I, I would be quite surprised. So Kobe said this was speculation with a little bit of information. So <laughs> listeners do with that what you will. Uh, Kobe, I want to take this opportunity to shift gears a little bit from the second round to the first round, the magic first pick in the first round, obviously, we talked about this off camera before we started recording, but Magic fans are like drawing into factions, and it's getting tribal. It's getting nasty <laughs> on Twitter. Team Chet, Team Jabari, Team Paolo. Okay, just like round robin really quickly, can you go through what you think kind of each of those three prospects offers the Magic? And then uh, who do you think the Magic take on draft night? Oh, man. All right. Uh, first off, the discourse is getting nasty. I need everybody to take a deep breath. It's going to be okay. Um, all right. So let me go in alphabetical order. So I think that would be Paulo first, right? Uh, Kara, I'll do alphabetical by last name. I was about I to say, I don't P. know. I don't know much, but yeah. P is not before C. Yeah, no. <laughs> it's, the, it's, the, it's the journalism, alphabetical by last name, mm-hmm. right? Uh, so, so with Paulo... No, just the, the scoring uh, scoring skill set is something that really pops out. You know, he has the potential to grow into the kind of three-level score um, that really thrives on this level. You know, the shooting, you know, it's there. It can improve a little bit, but you can see the, the, the tools of a guy who can, you know, get to the level of, you know, being reliable from three, you know, can be, be reliable from mid-range and then also, you know, be effective at the rim. And then he's also... You know, sometimes his passing is overlooked. You know, he offers that, you know, a guy who can operate from the perimeter, but even maybe the, po- well, you know, mid post, pinch post, um, block, to, you know, be a hub and be able to pass, be able to distribute, but also look for his own shot in multiple ways. His defense is something that I'm a little concerned about. Not extremely, just a little bit concerned because there is a, um, you know, you want to, you, when you're looking at this, you know, you're, you're seeing, you know, the playoffs, you know, both guys who are effective at a high level on both ends. And he's a guy you just wonder, like, is he going to be that effective on both ends? Um, some people believe yes. Some people say oh, they're not really sure. And there also is a uh, – oh, not a question, but something that I guess he'll need to prove once he gets to the NBA of how much of his production of in the college was based on him being a physical – mismatch against college guys i'm gonna explain this well but like him just being able to physically impose his way on college guys better than he'll be able to in the pros if that makes sense like yeah he was a man amongst at, boys in that co- in college yeah so when the playing field gets a little bit more even physically will he be able to dominate the same way that he did in college that's something that i i've heard um not hurt is is a not a concern but something that's also you know being put into this um I guess into the intel of his scouting, right? Um, what's 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 uh, Chet? There we go. I must say, what's what's the next in alphabetical yeah. order? Chet, uh, you know, for him, it's it's just the potential, right? You know, but also he he did produce. It's not like this is a guy just like it's just this raw, you know, talent. Like there is a very you know, um, 
refined skill set there on both ends. You know, I think the shot blocking, the protection is the first thing that really jumps out. You know, that size, that length, the coordination, the quickness, the agility. You know, to have a guy who can be a hub, a hub defensively, uh, is something that you don't get a lot from year to year. Just a guy you can be like, you know what? No matter what's going on the floor, we put this guy on, you know, in the middle of our defense, we're going to be a good defense. No matter what's going on, no matter who we put it around, you know, if we have Jalen, Cole, Franz, Wendell, whoever's going to be on the floor, we're going to have a good defense because this guy's going to grow into a multi-talented defender. And then he has an offensive game that didn't really get to get shown um, as much at Gonzaga, but you can see, you know, the shooting touch is there, the touch around the rim is there, the passing is there, you know, the way he operates in transition, fluid, smooth, at that size is something that you don't see a lot of. You know, there's also belief that, you know, he can be effective off the dribble. You know, to, to the extent you're not sure, will he grow into that, you know, that kind of number one scoring option that you hope to get with the number one pick? Still very much an unknown, but you can see a little bits and pieces of that um, as a role man, uh, a guy pick and pop game. Like there's just so much versatility in his game that I think intrigues people, but also scares people because, you know, you do have the size and you just kind of like, is he going to be able to um, be physically, be able to physically impose his way on the game that you want, you know, from a guy of seven feet, seven foot plus. Um, and then with Jabari, this, just the the shooting is like the first thing that really pops out with you, right? Just the an, a, one of the more elite shooting prospects we've seen in what? I can't even remember the last time we've seen a guy who comes in, like a, not just shooting, but shooting with that size. And then be able to shoot from anywhere on the floor, you know, not just the three, but he, he can... You can give the ball to him in the mid post and you just shoot over anybody. Um, and then defensively, the ability to switch, you know, one to four, you know, two to four, just a big long wing or forward rather, who from day one, he just feels like he can just go on the floor. He can just play and you don't have to worry about it. Like, even if he doesn't live up to the, the potential he has, get the handle right, get the scoring, um, self creation ability. All the way there, you just feel like he's going to be able to contribute from day one. I see there's some smiles going on here, so there's there's none, man. There's none. Nope. There's none. Nope. Oh, nope. No, there's smiles and laughs. Nope. <laughs> no. 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 We uh no. So so Jonathan and I have been we I I I teetered a lot longer for sure than Jonathan, but we recently had um, Eric Fawcett on, who covers the draft for NBA Canada, Japan, India, all those ent- entities. Um, and he was definitely like the most convincing guest that we've had about Jabari specifically, right? Um, people, cause a lot of people like to talk about, you know, who try to knock on Jabari. They say he's a three and D guy glorified. Like he's not going to be, you know, much more than that. And then, you know, Eric was really able to, uh, break down Jabari and, and, and what he was able to do, um, his touches and, and how, you know, a lot of people try to talk about, you know, the, as far as Jabari goes, um, with you know his dribbles, you saw. I'm sure you saw the graphic, Kobe, where they talked about like yeah. the amount of dribbles Jabari took. It was like whatever it was, 90 dribbles and and 93 shots or something like that, right? And it Eric, was field goals made. It was field goals right, made. Right, 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 yeah. So Eric's point was like that's just efficient. Like that that's not that shouldn't be used as like a knock on like his you know inability to dribble and create whatever it might be. He's efficient. He's taller than everybody. He's shooting over everybody outside on the perimeter. So I, I think that you know Jabari is kind of the guy that I've landed on. He made me feel a lot better about Paolo, you know, on that episode as well. And I came into it thinking like Chet one or two, and now Chet's kind of lower on the totem pole for me at, at three. And and it's not. It just is what it is, man. It's crazy. Chet is scary for both better and worse. Chet is scary. So I want to ask you, Kobe. Where are you kind of leaning in all of this? And do you find yourself like kind of flip-flopping as much as we do? Or have you just done enough research that you're like, no, I just clearly know like uh, where I'm at on these prospects? Yeah, before I answer that, I want to hear Jonathan's uh, part of it too. Luke, you so yourself, you? so I, I love Jabari. And Eric did a great job of kind of putting some of my concerns about like his shot creation at ease. Because it was it was like 96 dribbles, 93 field goals made. And he's like... What is wrong with a guy that doesn't need a lot of dribbles to create his own shot? What what's what's the problem with that? They weren't all spot ups. A lot of it was just like, you know, jab step, one dribble, pull up or, you know, jab step, one dribble, step back three. So he he was 
in his own way efficient at creating his own shot effectively. But to me, I really, if I'm the front office, I really have to be convinced that he is going to evolve into a number one option. Because if he doesn't, then he's really just like a glorified 3 and D guy, right? He's, he's long. He's a very versatile defender. We know he can shoot the crap out of the basketball. But if he doesn't evolve as a shot creator and as a playmaker for others, to me, he's just like, you know, Mikhail Bridges at 6'10", which is a good player, but it's not a guy that you draft number one overall. You know what I mean? So I love the idea of Jabari. Like if, if you're John Hammond and Jeff Weltman and you tell me, no, Jonathan, we are so convinced this guy is going to evolve it to be a number one option, then I take him running away from the other two guys. That's just me personally. But I that is what I don't know about Jabari. What I don't know about Chet if it is his body going to withstand 80 to 100 plus basketball games a year at this level. To me, Paolo is the safest pick because I'm pretty confident what he's going to be. The defense doesn't really worry me because of the guy that we have at the head of this team, Jamal Mosley. He's not going to let anybody come on this team and not put for, you know put forth their best effort defensively. That's just the culture that they've built. So I'm leaning Jabari, but I am I'm 100% honest when I say this. I will be fine with whoever we take on the 23rd. Yeah, no, for sure. It's funny. You said, I laugh a little bit. You said a 16 McCall Bridges is like, oh my gosh, that'd be a hell of a player. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh. The cover is like, what's I think he's like six, seven. If he was three yeah, inches tall, so. I'd be like, oh my gosh. Um, but no, that's the thing that's, that's so interesting to me about this, this top three. I feel like regardless of who's taken, like you gotta be happy with the guy. Like there's a certain level of happiness with the guy because they're all, well, I guess outside of Chet, like Paulo and Jabari are like to me forwards, right? And then Chet's like this a big, and I guess Paulo is more of a big. So I guess Paulo and Chet project to be more bigs or whatever positions. Uh, uh, but yeah, so it's, it's really interesting that they're all kind of like these guys. So you can be like, all right, you can play maybe most likely going to be a four or a five, you know, depending on the lineups. Um, and, but they just bring like all different sides of the game. With a little bit of interlap, uh, overlap, but there's just like these very different players in a way. Um, so yeah, just like a very interesting, like I guess front court players to have three front court players be like the consistent top three, but they're all so distinct from one another um, in multiple different ways. It's actually really interesting. I can't wait to see. I know this is looking way too far ahead, but like five years from now, mm. it's like how the distinctions grow or how they maybe come together because there are parts of there are parts of Paulo's game I wish um, Jabari had, and vice versa. Right. Uh, and then Chet just like Chet's such a different kind of prospect with that size, and it's just like you're your own kind of mm-hmm. you're your own kind of guy. Like there's no, and that's what makes like you said so scary, but also so fascinating, right? Like you're your own kind of prospect. We have nothing to base this off of, or very little to base this off of. Um, you. It, I'm not much trying to stray too far away from the point. Luke, you asked me like where I'm, I'm leaning right now personally, um, and this is I was feeling this way going into the lottery, um, and then talking with you know scouts, front office people, um, just people around the league about this. Jabari's kind of my guy, um, who I should feel like should be number one, mm-hmm. and I'll and I'll explain why Jabari, and then I'll also like kind of back up you know Paulo and Chet too. Because I'm not trying to make it. It's not so much like what they aren't. It's just more so I think what Jabari can be. Um, so for me, there is a, like to me, I said earlier, there's a baseline of he's going to be productive offensively. It may not be, you know, give him the ball with, you know, um, you know, give him the ball at the top of the key, you know, everybody move out and just go to work. It may not be that, you know, at least from day one or day two or year one or year two, whatever. But there's a very strong baseline for what he can do. And it, 3 and D, I think, undersells what his, like, when we're talking about shooting, it's not just outside shooting. It is, you could throw it to him um, in the post and just tell him, get your shot off. And he's going to be able to do it because he just has the ability to shoot over his defender more often than not. And that's a skill that sometimes, you know, we can be watching and we like it, but that's a skill that I think sometimes you don't, Take into account when talk about shooting. That is like a valuable, like it's a valuable shooting skill. Be able to get it off over anybody from any 
spot on the floor without needing a dribble. So, um, so Eric's point, he doesn't need a dribble with that. You can just throw it to him and he can just get, uh, he can just go up. Yep. So to me, there's already going to be a baseline of, all right, he's going to be able to contribute as a scorer offensively, no matter what. Then you add in the versatility defensively, and not just versatility, but also for effort. And you just know there's a certain, you know, and this isn't disparaging anybody else, but there's a certain level of just steadiness with him that you just feel like, no matter what's going to happen, Jabbar is going to be able to bring X, Y, and Z. His, he does need to improve his handle um, to be able to just create a little bit more because there are going to be defenders who, you know, can match him physically, um, can match him physically, can match him lengthwise, who can just disrupt him a little bit more, and he'll have to find a way to create his separation a little bit better, you know, without, you know, kind of more so self-create that space. And I think the handle can, like the handle is such a thing that I think it can improve um, very much so. And I think that's the kind of thing that can improve quicker than, say, a shot. I think it takes a little bit more time to improve in shot than it does a handle. Um, I The finishing, like being able to create inside the arc, uh, or I guess more so in the paint, being able to get, like, actually drive to the paint and finish there, that's where I'm just kind of like, you need to figure that out. But even that's something I feel like, all right, you can work on that, and that's something with a better handle. He'll be able to grasp better because the shot – and the touch makes me feel like once he gets there, he should be able to finish better. It's just about taking that step to getting there. Um, so I think that's the main thing he, he'll need to work on. But there's a certain level of confidence I have that he'll get there, um, if that makes sense. Like, that's the main thing I'm just trying to figure out. Can you work on your handle enough to the point where you can create separation and then create lanes for yourself that you can do more so on your own skill than having to rely on others, if that makes sense. And I think he can get there. I have a the higher confidence level he can get there. Once you get that player, mm. we're talking about, you know, a go-to option, 20, 25, you know, 22, 25, whatever, guy, day in and day out. Um, Paul, I guess I'll go with Paulo. Paulo, I, I kind of, I guess, spoke on him. Like, I believe he's going to be a very solid a player. And not just because of the scoring, not just because of the possible three of scoring, but I think he's, he's a good passer. He's a guy who I just feel like, you know, you can throw into a bunch, bunch of different systems. He should be able to go to work and just thrive. Um, defensively, I do agree, Jonathan, that, you know, you put him in Orlando, I think some of the defensive concerns are a lot, a little overblown. They're not like, he's not a slouch. He is active. He will have energy. He will bring it. It's just there's a certain level of, I don't know if he'll be elite. Right. I can see Jabari being elite. I don't, I can see Chet becoming elite. I don't know if Paulo's going to be elite. Maybe he will be. This isn't, you know, everybody's young. They can grow. But, uh, trying to see the framework of an elite defensive player for him, I don't see it. I can see it for Jabari very early on. Um, and even, I guess, to the same level, the same extent with Chet. Uh, with Chet, there's just, uh, I like Chet. There's, I, it, I kept going back and forth between him, Chet, and Jabari for a lot of this time. Um, the, the potential for what he could be, and I think Gonzaga, the way that they played almost undersold his skills. There's a lot more skill than he was able to show, and I think the good thing about him is he doesn't play away from contact. He like he will he's up for the physical challenge, but it's just I think it will take him a little bit more time to get to his ceiling if you know if he gets to his theoretical ceiling where he think he can be, and I'm just not you know, and maybe this is me being more safer. Um, I'm just not sure if he'll get there to that point. Maybe you will, maybe you won't, but I'm just not. I'm not as certain. I'm not as certain about Chet as I am with Jabari. If that makes any mm-hmm. sense. Yeah. What uh, we know that the Magic are, are very tight lipped. What, if anything, are you hearing from the organization in terms of you know they might be leaning one way or the other? Uh, from organization, nada. No, yeah, that's what I figured. Yeah, I mean, you can you you get more feel around from people around the league than the actual organization. Um. I, mean, I think it's been said, so I don't think I think most people view this as a two person, you know, one two is between Chet and Jabari. That's the feeling that's what I was hearing when I was uh in Chicago and just even speaking with people after uh since Chicago, you know, that's the feeling I got. It's between Chet and Jabari. Um Yeah, but from the actual organization itself, now you're not gonna get a whole lot out of them in yeah, terms of right. that. But yeah, I, I'm from what I'm hearing and what I'm being told, I, I think it's pretty much between those two. Unless something, I mean, obviously things can change and it could change, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be, be, be between those. Who now, obviously, you know, like you're saying, like to you, it's a two man draft. And that's something that I've been kind of saying for the last couple of weeks. 
is that it just feels like uh, you know Paulo is kind of at by the wayside, right? Like he's a safe plug and play type of guy that you hope can become elite, but you're just not sold that he will. Now, at the end of the day, I won't be surprised at, at any of these guys becoming elite. I think that they're all great in their own right. Like you said, they're all very different. And there's definitely things that you could make the, the best player of all time, probably, if you took like their elite skills from each of them and just gave them Chet size and, and that it's over, right? Um, so, yeah. But going back to what I was saying was, you know, you, you've got a feeling it's Chet or Jabari. Do you not like what you want, but if you had to really put a pinpoint on number one, who is it? Jabari. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I mean, for the reasons I, said, I kind of said earlier, but I think that would, if we were like, to, what's today? Uh, whatever today is, if we were going into like today, pinpoint, I, I think if the draft were like tomorrow at evening, I'd be like, I'm probably going to pick Jabari. Yeah. That, that would be my Vegas tends to agree. Really? I, that's crazy. I actually haven't checked he's, Vegas. He's I'll the, leave. like, by far the betting favorite right now. He's at minus 400. Yeah. And I think really? earlier today when I when I checked, uh, next was Chet at plus 150. Yeah. So he's the really? strong betting favorite right now, Jabari. And Paulo, they're, yeah, they're saying, doesn't have a chance. <laughs> it's due to, yeah. like, Judd by the odds. He's, like, plus something crazy. I don't even know what it was. I have plus 1,000 or plus 2,000 or yeah. something like that. That's funny. I haven't checked. I'm, I'm being honest. I haven't checked Vegas's odds. Mm-hmm. I mean, maybe I checked them after the lottery, just like stumbled upon them. Yeah, but I have right. not. Che- I haven't even thought about that. This Vegas knows, man. Vegas knows. They always uh, know something. They know something. Vegas about. always knows something. But yeah, I think that's. It's it's funny because if the Magic or Thunder didn't win the, like, if they weren't one and two, I think it would be different. Yeah. You know, in terms of like who I think Paul will have a better chance if. You know, if Houston was number one, mm-hmm. I think they probably would have a much better chance of being draft number one. But it's just like the Magic and Thunder being these kind of teams that they right. are. Um, I think one and two is going to be between. Yeah. Jabari and Chet. And I'm pretty sure Jabari is going to be number one. I also wonder how different it would be if there was other teams that one and two outside of OKC and Orlando solely because not because of fit or or players or whoever, um, but just because of front office, right? Like you said, the Magic very tight lipped. Okay, C, tight-lipped as well. So you just wonder, like, would there be a consensus number one at this point if it was different, a different team at number one just because they, you know, for whatever reason, they're not as tight-lipped. Um, we know that's the case with a lot of these teams in the NBA, that the information gets out somehow. So I, I do wonder if, if, if the picks were switched, kind of if we would already know, is there already a consensus number one? It's starting to feel like Jabari is is getting to that point, but I just don't know. It's kind of going up against time, right? Like, I just don't know by June 23rd if it's going to be fleshed out all the way, but I wouldn't be shocked. I'm starting to feel that way myself, and I don't know if it's just because of things that are silly like Vegas odds, although I do put stock into that, um, as well as, like, my own personal feeling and what we're hearing. I It's, I don't know, man. It's hard as the top pick in the draft to not have your number one, like, preference revealed but if anybody can do it it's the magic yeah and i guess i wouldn't be like i said this is all saying i wouldn't be surprised if check was the guy like mm-hmm. check very much fits mm-hmm. very but very much fits what the magic have gone for you know and other players shoot i mean they you know guys who they still have on their roster right mm-hmm. or you know on the team last year so i wouldn't be surprised if you know the magic came away from this like oh we can't we can't you know we can't pass up on Chet's potential upside right I could very much see that being the case yeah. too, um, but there's you know something about Jabari at one just mm-hmm. something about just sticking on me right now. So maybe it changed. You know they still have to, as of this moment right now. I don't believe you know any of those three have done their workouts with Orlando yet. So there's still obviously things can change, and I really want to emphasize that because it is so tight it's at the top, things can change. Um, but as of right now, I'm, I'm leaning more to Jabari. Is there a possibility that we don't see those guys work out for the team? We just see them come in for interviews? Uh, I mean, I guess if anything's possible, right? I guess anything's possible. But Is it I, I likely? Like, yeah, I, I would say it's probably not likely that they would. I feel like they would actually, you know, get on the floor and do some, like something to some extent. Um, do interviews. Get Mosley out there with like them, maybe. There would be like a... 
Yeah. <laughs> Get Mosley out there, see if he can guard uh, mm -hmm. Paolo. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, like like or, we uh, saw with like we saw when he yeah. he was like almost fresh off the plane. He was already in the gym with Mo Bamba, so I remember that very well and gave me a good feeling. Yeah, just throw 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 Jamal out there. I don't know what if there's rules to that or whatever. I don't care. Throw Jamal on the court. I want to see Jamal in the post for sure. Something tells me that's not allowed, but I'll make sure to tell <laughs> yeah. them that. Uh, <laughs> These workouts, hey, go go guard them now. Kobe, uh, where are you going to be draft night? We shall see. I'm still figuring that out. Uh, yeah, we, we shall see. I'll, I'll know hopefully by the end of this week. Well, uh, if you're going to be in Orlando, we'd we, uh, like to see you at Harry Buffalo before the uh, Orlando Magic Draft Party. We'll be there hanging out a little bit, and then we'll walk over to Amway for the official Magic Draft Party. Yeah, if I'm if I'm in Orlando, I'll definitely because I know if if I'm in Orlando, I'll be going to the uh, mm -hmm. they, the team has their you know, for the media they have like their draft watch thing as well. Um, right. So if I'm in Orlando, I'll I'll definitely be going there. I'm either going to be in Orlando or New York. So right. One right. of those two. Back at Barclays, just kind of plopped right in the middle of Brooklyn there, right? <laughs> yeah, and the thing is, I really like the arena. It's just like such a, I mean, like it's more of a New York thing. Even with Madison Square Garden, it just feels like it's like more centralized. Right. Maybe I don't know Brooklyn as well. So maybe that's why it feels kind of just like, oh, you're just here. Mm -hmm. Well, but I've heard that from a lot of people, actually, that it just feels kind of yeah. awkwardly placed in the middle of Brooklyn. Yeah, it's kind of like anything could have been there. Right. Mm -hmm. And if you like moved three blocks over or five blocks over, be like, oh, all right, there it is again. Just, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. Awesome. You could be anywhere, so yeah. Well, two and a half weeks until the draft. Again, we're recording this on uh, June fifth, so just a little, you know, little under uh, over two and a half weeks, depending on how you look at it. But Kobe, thank you for joining the show again, man. We're looking forward to the rest of your coverage, you know, into the draft, summer league, next season, all that kind of stuff. And uh, appreciate you coming on the show. We'll see you at Amway next season. Absolutely appreciate you having me on. Really do. Uh, really quick, uh, let every know, everyone know where they can find you, where they can find all your work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter, uh, K-H-O-B-I underscore P-R-I-C-E. Uh, go to the Orlando Sentinel. You can find all my work there. Subscribe. I'm going to say it again. Subscribe. Because <laughs> uh, that's how you, what you, you got to do to free my work. So let's, let's right. do this. Get I am subscribed. Up. So uh, the rest of you go. out there, subscribe. Yeah. Of course, bro. We got to support my man. So, Kobe, thank you for joining the show, bro. I don't appreciate y'all for real. That was our interview with Kobe Price. Shout out Kobe Price. Thank you for joining the podcast. Hopefully we'll see Kobe Price, Harry Buffalo, June 23rd. If not, we know that he is in New York at the draft, which would be super cool for him. So uh, yeah, hopefully uh, that happens for him. I know he's just trying to figure out where he's going to be that night. Luke, one thing we didn't talk about in the intro, the Magic mm -hmm. are losing uh, Matt Lloyd, who's been with the Magic for 10 years. He just most recently was the assistant GM, um, and now he is off to Minnesota to be the uh, senior vice president of uh, basketball operations under Tim Connolly there. Tim Connolly's first hire after leasing, leaving the Denver Nuggets for the Minnesota Timberwolves. Again, Matt Lloyd was with the team for 10 years, uh, was really involved with like the, the scouting department, uh, did a lot of work on you know all the drafts and everything like that. And by all cases, is super well liked in the organization and across the league. We'll miss Matt Lloyd, and you know, definitely wish him the best in Minnesota. Yep, and uh, you know, has just been long tenures, and with every you know organization, it seems like Chicago. He was there for thirteen years, um, really building up his his network, and and I'm assuming gaining trust, um, and and you know, people trusted him enough to be in the roles that he is in. Incredible hire for. For Minnesota, we knew it was coming. Uh, just didn't know when, and so congratulations to Matt Lloyd. Yeah, I think he started in like public relations in Chicago, mm -hmm. and then like just worked his way up onto like the basketball op side of things. So again, uh, you know, Matt Lloyd, we'll miss you. Miss you. Wish you the best of luck in uh, in, in Minnesota. Not too much luck, you know. We want to win a, a, a title, obviously, but sure. uh, but yeah, congrats to Matt Lloyd. Uh, yeah, uh, again, folks, June 23rd, the night of the draft, we will be at Harry Buffalo before the draft party from 5, 5 o'clock to 6.30. Then we'll head over to Amway for like the Magic's official draft party, so make sure that you guys come out. Again, shout out to Kobe Price. For Luke Sylvia, this has been Jonathan Osborne. You guys are listening to The Six Man Show. We will catch you guys next time. See ya. Thanks for listening to The Six Man Show. 
Be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, and Stitcher to get new episodes downloaded directly to your phone. Please take a minute to give us a five-star rating and a review. It would really help us out a lot. Follow us on Twitter and Instagram at Six Man Show and like us on Facebook. We'll catch you guys next time. Go Magic!